to remember that everybody sees the world through their own lens. I was using the example of a, a telescope uh, with somebody and we all have the view that we see. And so as you're starting off in business or even later on in business, everyone's gonna have that amazing piece of advice. And so just to really take everything in with a ton of gratitude that people in their heart, their desire is to help you, but then to also recognize that everybody's wonderful piece of advice is from their very focused view, from their experience. And it's tinged with all of the, the baggage they bring with them in life. And so to listen to it, but to also always make sure that it rings true to your experience, it feels right, double check it, ask other people. It's well-meaning, but Again, we all have our own perspective and just recognize that everyone's advice is coming from their perspective. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and uh, we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, uh, Linda Neidinger, as close as I'm going to get to getting it right. Uh, but Linda was, uh, uh, during high school, was a, a talented uh, high or athlete and played tennis and uh, at least uh, found that she was a good or within the realm that she played in. And uh, then as she started to uh, play higher level uh, or, or players and played more difficult, it told, or the coach told her she needed to think or think more while she was playing, which she thought was counterintuitive, but uh, was a bit impactful for later on in her career. Um, tennis didn't work out, didn't go pro, but uh, had a fun time doing it. And then uh, went into college, um, did a, originally did pre-med, um, then, uh, but was at the same time doing a interdisciplinary major decided she didn't want to do pre-med, but rather went into psychology, started out doing school psychology, um, then uh, took a break off to uh, be a stay-at-home mom for a while. Um, and then she found as she was entering in the workforce, um, lost a bit of confidence um, in go and re-entering the workforce, um, also went through some uh, marital relationship issues and uh, took some time to, uh, uh, took a course in women entrepreneurship, um, which uh, set her in a different direction, which uh, then she decided to work with adults instead of kids and uh, in psychology as well as doing a bit of coaching so with that much as an introduction welcome on the podcast Linda thank you wow that's a journey uh, when you hear it, someone else say it <laughs> absolutely so now I just took a journey then condense a much longer journey into the 30 or 45 second version so let's unpack that a bit and go back uh, a bit back in time to where your journey started uh, playing uh, tennis in high school okay awesome Devin it's interesting because you and I were chatting previously and you had said, you know, hey, what's your what's your story starting back in high school? And my interest in mindset and the brain really does have its its seed, its beginning in high school. And it's I can so vividly remember that panicked feeling of being a high school athlete where I could shine easily on my own team and then facing these competitors from other schools that just had a different level of background in, in tennis. And, and really, like, I can feel that in my body as I say that. I've really got a physical memory of that. And what is wrong with me that I can win in one situation and not in another? And then having that experience where my coach had said to me, you're just not thinking enough. You know, why, think more. You're, you know, are you zoning out? Where are you? You need to be thinking. And I was in high school. I didn't know anything about anything. And this was the eighties when sports psychology was a mysterious thing that the Russians used with their Olympians, but something about that, I knew that wasn't right. I knew that the more I thought, the more I, I tensed up. I mean, I guess I didn't know that, but I knew that when I thought things, that's when things went worse. When I'm playing my own teammates, I was relaxed and it was fun and there was nothing on the line. And then a different person would show up in competition. And that was sort of that seed of even through college, I was as I was studying neuroscience and psychology and chemistry and psychiatry, I always had that to reflect back on. How does this relate to that experience I had? Where's the answer? And I encountered some things as I was learning academically. And I, I 
found the experience uh, of flow. It was called, it's called flow. It's still called flow, but it was a brand new idea back then that when you're doing something you love, you get lost in it. It is all joy. You lose that sense of time. And that was exactly was my issue. I was in a flow state in practice. I was a great practice player. Lots of great athletes don't make it to the next level because they're great practice players and they crush under the weight of competition. Your mind starts to get away from you. And so I wasn't in flow. Thinking breaks up flow. When you bring your your conscious mind starts to come through and think things whereas before that you were in this nice flow state so now you say okay you kind of figure that out and you're you know unfortunately your uh, tennis career never quite took off didn't reach pros but had a great time doing it in high school now as you go now going off to college and say okay I'm going to um, at least initially start in uh, pre-med and start to study that now how did your what made you kind of go, uh, veer off of pre-med and go more into psychology or kind of how did that come about you know, honestly, it was probably the thread of allowing that voice in my brain, which I call anxious mouse. Um, I even have, I brought him this time. This is anxious mouse and he lives in everybody's brain. I have a real thread in my life of allowing anxious mouse to talk me out of things. And I was at an Ivy League university. I mean, these are really smart. I was in class with really smart people who had their sights on Harvard Med. I did not have my sights on Harvard Med. But I let myself talk myself out of the fact that I probably wasn't smart enough or talented enough. I didn't belong in med school. And that was the first thing that got me out of the pre-med. But I love the brain. And so that's what got me into psychology. And I did study, I have a master's in experimental psychology where I did study sports psychology. Uh, but I also had a background working with children. I had worked with children in lots of different settings. And so I ended up working in school psychology, where a lot of this, nobody talks about these things with young children, but these habits start as a young child, where we start to think of ourselves as less than, not capable of. And so even though I wasn't intentionally focusing, it wasn't meaning to work on children with children on this, but it's just always been there because I had that initial interest back in high school. And so I did school psychology for a while and I've worked with children as young as preschool up through high school. And then I took a break. I felt like I was, we were financially able for me to take a break. And it just felt for me personally, a little disingenuous to be working with other people's children and to not have any time with my own. So I did spend a lot of time. I spent 10 years as a stay at home mom. And I knew I wanted to, I mean, I always wanted to work. I love working. I love sharing these things with people. It really lights me up. But I just hadn't been in that setting for a while. And here, you know, here's Anxious Mouse again. I really want to get back into the workforce. I don't know where I belong. Do I even have a skill set anymore that's valuable? I, you know, stay at home mom. How do I talk somebody into what I did for the last 10 years? They talk about that gap, having a gap in your resume. That, that scared the heck out of me. How do I explain a 10 year gap in some way that makes me relevant and, and gives me meaning in the workforce? And it was at that time that I had some personal issues. And I'm just very fortunate that, that I am interested in the brain and that I do have a lot of resources from my own upbringing that I was able to call on. Let me, let me just, okay. one okay. question before we get too far away from the journey, because I did have one question. So I definitely make sense. So you get, you come out of college and you're saying, okay, going to go into, you know, or child psychology, you're going into the school system and helping out kids with psychology makes sense. And then you're saying, okay, now as I'm becoming a mother, having the kids, I want to spend time with them. I'm going to take a break off. Again, makes perfect sense. My wife is a stay-at-home mom. She loves uh, being with the kids and I absolutely commend her. Her job is much harder than mine. And so with that is now as you're saying, okay, I assume, but I'll put words in your mouth and you can correct me where I'm wrong. What was the decision and what was the trigger to come back into the workforce? Or was it kids going off to being full-time students or going off to college or I don't know, or kind of what was the genesis for saying, okay, now I'm going to re-enter the workforce, which then triggered, hey, now I've, I've got to deal with the, a bit of, I don't know, anxiety or worry of, you know, resume gap and getting back in, figuring things out and re-engaging kind of, what was the trigger and the genesis for kind of coming back in the workforce after uh, they're staying at home with the kids for a while? Mm, that's a great question. I think I always had that debate, debate's a kind word for it, argument in my head. And it's, it's, the, it's the argument, it's the debate that women have still, stay at home or work. And 
you can't do both. Can you do both? Should you do both? Which one's more valuable? If you are an intelligent person, are you throwing away your potential by staying at home? I mean, it's, it's a huge issue. I, my children now are, I have one in college and one in a senior in high school. And I meet women all the time at every late, at every stage of child, their child's age, constantly having this debate. It's really hard. And I, I don't think I'd ever really come fully to terms with the fact that I had, I was completely at home. I did dabble here and there in some part-time work that was flexible. Um, I knew that a lot of people go back to work once their children are finished elementary school. And as a school psychologist, I knew that the period in development that is really most crucial are the middle school years. That is when a lot of parents suddenly, they had a lot of interest and in, in, uh, interaction in their children's lives. And then right at this moment where these children are starting to figure out or trying to, trying to figure out who they are, all of a sudden their parent is not as available as they used to be. So it was meaningful to me to still be home in those middle school years, but I was also really getting antsy and that argument in my head of, am I, am I letting my fears run the show here? Am I really authentically making this decision based on what I think is right for my family and myself? There's a lot going on in your mind. And at some point then the voice got louder that, no, I really want to be, I want to figure out what I can do that I'm passionate about and that I can still balance with my family life. And in preparation for the fact that once my kids were in high school, and if anybody's listening and you're and you're, you have young children, the biggest transition that happens is when your children get a driver's license. And I, I had no idea until somebody with children just a little bit older than mine told me that. That's a huge difference. You go from being so central in your children's life to not being them not needing you that much. And I, I think I saw that coming and I really wanted to not be that woman who all of a sudden was lost and feeling like they were floating with no meaning in their life. I didn't want to be that person. I knew I had so much to give and I wanted to be working. I just didn't know where and how to make it happen again. Um, no, and I think that uh, definitely, I think there's always that balance or those, you know, competing interests. And it's always trying to find the, the right balance and, and what makes sense uh, for, for each individual as far as uh, how they or what journey they're going to take. So now as you're saying, okay, decided I'm coming back into the workforce and you're, you're balancing those uh, you know, those, those competing interests as well as a fear and figuring out what that place will be. What made you decide to, you know, kind of gravitate more towards, you know, adults and maybe, you know, in some of that aspect as opposed to going back to the school system or their children or those type of things. What was the, the motivating factor there? Honestly, I feel like I was a little burnt out on the whole kid thing. I'd lived it 24 seven. I loved working as a school psychologist. As a coach, I still continue to have a lot of ch uh, child clients, youth clients, because people know me from that part of my life. And I have a lot of resources to bring and I can coach rather than doing counseling, which is just a little different. Um, but yeah, so I, I was just enjoying, I was looking for more adult interaction and I was really loving talking about meeting with adults, talking about these issues with adults. And I already had this huge psychology piece, which fits together so perfectly with coaching. Although not all coaches, most coaches don't have it and you don't need it. I mean, coaching is a very nebulous thing and I, I'm not gonna judge anybody from any background. You do have to be careful because there are so many coaches out there. Sure. But all these pieces of my background, I felt worked so perfectly. Once I really researched, what is coaching? Again, it's like that nebulous word. Everyone's a coach. When I really figured out what it was and I researched what it was, I knew everything, all the bells and whistles went off that going back to those experiences as far back as high school and all the things I've learned and all my background fit so perfectly because in my coaching, I really bring in all of that brain work. It's so comforting to people when you realize that the things, the self-defeating things that you do are a really natural outcome of the way our brains are meant to work, to operate. Our brains just aren't built to operate in this modern world where we make up goals for ourselves. And once you learn how to work with your brain, things are so much easier. And 
when I put these pieces together, it was really the idea of being able to give this to people and have that be my job was very exciting. It really lit me up. It, it was that, you know, when people are looking for their passion, I knew I found my passion. So I went and I became certified as a coach and I just put it out, you know, we started into the business development part here. I have, you want to talk about fears. You want to talk about anxious mouse chirping in your head. My dad was a family physician. My mom was a teacher. I had worked in school systems. Like I did not have any resources. I had no knowledge of how do you build a business? That was all brand new to me, which was also exciting, but all brand new. And so I dove into that part and I let it, I had to, I had to be a little vulnerable and put it out there to everyone in my network. Hey, I've become a coach. I'm taking all my personal experience and putting it towards coaching and I'm starting a business. And that was really scary because then you don't know, are people going to, is anyone going to respond? <laughs> and it, they did. And that was the beginning of how I have built my business is just being vulnerably willing to put it out there all the time what I do, how I help people, and that I'm open for conversations to explore things with people. Now, no, and I think that's definitely a very insightful uh, part of your journey. So now kind of catching us up a bit to where you're at today. So you kind of journey back on your own, decided you're going to focus a bit more on, you know, adults as clientele, and then even more so on coaching, um, took the classes, got the certifications, got things going. So where does that put you today? So as a business, you know, you and you're doing the solo thing, which I think is amicable or ab admirable. I don't know, amicable, but admirable. <laughs> and uh, I'll already, you know, you're building a business, you're looking to bring people on and, and increase a coaching. Cause you know, I've seen coaching go both ways to where sometimes it makes sense. You just want to do it on your own and you want to have your own coaching, you know, um, lifestyle and other people are saying, no, I'm going to build it to where it's, I'm able to help more people. So kind of give us an idea of where's the business today. So I am currently still a solopreneur and I do have a completely full practice because I am balancing it. I am still doing the mom thing. I have consciously made the choice. I mean, we all have those moments where we complain to ourselves in our head. And so I'm coaching myself 24 seven. I consciously made the decision to dive into some pretty big projects at my son's school because it's my, my last chance. And so I have a completely full one-on-one -on -one practice. I do have an online course. I don't promote it that often. And I do have a lot of ideas for other online courses I'd like to develop so that I could reach more people at an easier entry level. I understand that the idea of entering into one-on-one -on -one coaching can be a little intimidating. And I also have a couple books floating around in my head. So I'm at that very exciting place where I'm less than a year from being an empty nester and I will have more time and I will have to prioritize which of these things I will explore, which direction I would like to go in terms of expanding the business part of my, my business or my coaching. Awesome. Well, sounds like uh, both uh, plenty of things to keep you busy right now and uh, plenty of things in the work that will continue to keep you busy. So an exciting time and uh, definitely excited to see where things go. So well, so now we've uh, reached kind of the where your journey, where you're currently at in your journey, maybe looking a bit into the future as far as the things that you have on the horizon. It's a great time to transition to the two questions I always ask at the end of each journey. Um, so the first question I'll always ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? What'd you learn from it? So as you've probably figured out from my journey, I, I love learning. I love I, I have the fear, I have a lot of anxious mouse, but I'm, I'm usually pretty good about diving in anyway. You see the quote everywhere, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. So when I was diving into becoming an entrepreneur, I was very, I'm the kind of person who's very susceptible to want to learn it all. And there is no end to companies marketing to businesses. And I spent a lot of time going for every shiny new thing. I'll take that free webinar. I'll take, I'll do the free software, the free trial on this. I'll try everything. And to a certain extent, that is important. There's a lot to learn and you want to be able to function well as a business. And there, 
there's a lot of technology out there. You want to figure out which pieces are right for me. At some point I had to catch myself and I do have two other coaches that I, we have a mastermind together. And so we support each other, but we also coach each other. And I recognized and called myself out that I needed to figure out, I had to stop going, being attracted to every shiny little thing. And I had to figure out what is working for me right now. What are the things that really make sense for me to put some effort into either investing in money and time. And then I need to be able to let everything else go. And I, if you're on anybody watching, if you're on LinkedIn, I mean, you know, my inbox is just every day, tens, hundreds of messages with people with some wonderful thing that's going to explode my profitability and my number of clients. And at the beginning, it all sounds very interesting and promising. And so it takes some self-control to be able to block out the noise, stay the course figure out what's working for you. What's the next thing to explore for growth purposes, but understand that it's not all an opportunity for growth. Well, and I think that there, you know, that it is a, a hard balance in the, you know, the shiny object syndrome, so to speak, because on the one hand, you know, you're wanting to stay focused. And then on the other hand, there's a lot of opportunities and it's hard to know is what I'm currently focusing on, what I should be, or is there a better opportunity over here, especially the early stages where you're also trying to focus, hey, if I'm going to get a business that needs to make money and be able to be self-sustaining and support itself. And so you're oftentimes even more gravitating towards assigning the objects because out of necessity, you're trying to figure out what works and what makes sense. And so I definitely understand how that how that mistake is made and also how everybody has to find the balance and where the the idea ideal is, is to where you're not chasing every idea, but you're focusing on what, what makes sense. So definitely a, a great insight. Yeah. You Second. can be very busy doing things that are not in any way helping your, your business, your career at all. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it, it's one where you have to make that. And on the other hand, you can sometimes so narrowly focus your business that you are very focused, but you're not making any money either because you're passing up the opportunities to where the opportunity really lies. So I think it is that focus and making sure that you're focusing on the right things and finding that balance. So with that, the second question I always ask is if you're talking to somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business, what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them? So this piece of advice is both life coaching and business coaching. And that is to remember that everybody sees the world through their own lens. I was using the example of a, a telescope uh, with somebody and we all have the view that we see. And so as you're starting off in business or even later on in business, everyone's going to have that amazing piece of advice. And so just to really take everything in with a ton of gratitude that people in their heart, their desire is to help you, but then to also recognize that everybody's wonderful piece of advice is from their very focused view from their experience. And it's tinged with all of the, the baggage they bring with them in life. And so to listen to it, but to also always make sure that it rings true to your experience, it feels right, double check it, ask other people. It's well-meaning, but again, we all have our own perspective and just recognize that everyone's advice is coming from their perspective. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot in there in the sense that, you know, sometimes people, I would agree, most people are pretty well-meaning. They're not trying to lead you astray. They're trying to give you advice, especially if you're asking them, they're trying to help you out. And yet not everybody's advice is created equal. Some people are giving it from a place of, hey, they're a bit jealous. Hey, they're a bit wanting to do what you're doing. Some people are very pessimistic. Some people are optimistic. Some people don't want to hurt your feelings. And you have to kind of sift through all that because they're all well-meaning. And I don't think anybody is trying to do anything other than help you out. But it doesn't mean all the advice is helpful or you should always take that into your business. And so I think finding the, bal or the balance of those people that can give you advice that is going to be helpful to your business, that is going to be insightful and is going to put you in the best direction is a, is a great uh, takeaway and a great insight. Well, as we wrap up, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an investor, they want to be an employee, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? I do have a website. So my, my coaching business, I call it Ultimate You Coaching. My website is ultimateyou-coaching.com. And I do have a weekly newsletter. The best way to get value from me or to just get to know me a bit better is 
get on my newsletter uh, list. Every week I have a topic and I walk you through why is this important? Why do people have trouble with it? And what are some strategies or tips to get you rolling to try to change your mindset or have a, a new insight in this area? So it's a completely value packed newsletter. And that's the best way to, to get in touch with me and find out more about what I do and what I'm like. All right. Well, I definitely encourage people to connect up, check out the newsletter, check out the information and always uh, have a learning mindset. So I think that's great. Well, as we wrap up, thank you again for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun, it's been a pleasure. Now for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell and you'd like to be guests on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So feel free to go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show. A um, couple more things as listeners, make sure to click subscribe, share, leave us a review because we want to make sure that everyone finds out about all these awesome episodes. And last but not least, if you ever need help with your patents, your trademarks, or anything else with your business, feel free to go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always, or always here to help. Thank you again, uh, uh, Linda, for coming on the podcast, and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thank you.